Ultra, and now it's Metro. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, yeah, so Servan is, uh, is yet another um, web thing for Haskell. I mean, there are, there are uh, very many different approaches to doing web programming in Haskell by now. Um, so what, what Servant really is, is it's a domain-specific language for describing web APIs. Um, you can call it a web framework, but it's not trying to be some sort of all-encompassing framework that does everything for you. It's trying to go from uh, being a language for describing APIs and then giving you useful functionality on top of that. And uh, it offers you bits and pieces that you can usually use it together with other libraries or even other frameworks. Uh, it's created not by me, uh, nor by WorldType. Uh, it's uh, created by, by uh, three people mostly, Alf and Sönke and Julian. Sönke and Julian are actually here, so if there are any questions that I cannot answer, then they can. Uh, it is somewhat... Um, Funnily ironic that Sergei today gave a talk about generic programming, which is what I've been working on many, many years, and and, <laughs> and then I'm going to give a talk about a servant, which is what, <laughs> what he actually knows more about, but uh, it's, it's part of the interesting stuff. <coughs> so I'm a relative newcomer to um, to servant. I have uh, made some changes that will be in the next release. Uh, I, I was mainly interested in it. Uh, from its from its technical approach, and I started to uh, to get more involved. Um, so let's uh, let's see. So um, what are the features of Servant? Um, the goal, the main goal, is that it should be as type safe as possible. There should be as little boilerplate code as possible when you write um, web applications like web servers, stuff like that. It should be extendable, so if you want to add something to Servant that isn't there before, you should ideally be able to do it without needing to change the core library. And then, what does it give you? It gives you tools to create um, web servers or web services. Uh, it gives you tools to create clients in Haskell. It gives you also tools to create client functions or functions that it act as a client for an existing web server. Um, that you can like export in, in other languages, so you can sort of export JavaScript functions that then act as client functions to a particular web service, or um, there are several other languages these days that, um, that are there. You can generate mock servers and clients that sort of send random data. You can generate type safe links, you can generate documentation, and I'm sure I've forgotten uh, a couple of um, uh, important but these are kind of the core um, features that Servant offers. Okay, so um, I'm going to first give the big picture, just to give you a little bit of context, uh, sort of the ideas of Servant, and, and I'm very specifically trying to make that understandable, that part, without knowing too much about Haskell. I'll also show code in the end, which is probably going to be mostly understandable to people who have seen some Haskell code before. So, um, so it, it's kind of a two-part split. Um, so if you think about what a web API is, actually, I mean, informally, um, then uh, it describes um, uh, what requests are valid, um, what, what kinds of requests you expect, um, what extra information you um, expect, so what you expect of the request body, what you expect of the request headers, um, what kind of parameters are there, what format should the body be in, and so on and so forth. And um, it also describes what is, what, what's the response like, what status codes are um, being sent, uh, what, uh, what's the response body look like, what is the acceptable <laughs> format of the response body, what is not, and so on and so forth. So, um, what is a Haskell type? Well, if you, if you look at it, a Haskell type describes for a piece of code what inputs the piece of code expects and what format those inputs are supposed to have and what is returned by the piece of code, what type that has and what format these data things have. So if you, if you look at it this way, then conceptually web APIs are very similar to types, to what we understand as types if you're coming from a Haskell perspective. So, um, so that is in a way the, the, uh, the, the idea here that Servant makes, 
uh, it's um, separating out, uh, first of all, um, a language for describing APIs on their own without actually giving an implementation for them. So there's the separation that many other web frameworks don't have. And secondly, it's actually going to consider web APIs as Haskell types rather than as Haskell values. And, um, and the, the rest that Servant does is all a consequence from that. So let's look uh, briefly at, at types versus terms. Haskell is a, a statically typed language, so that means in practice that every term that you write down, everything in your program is assigned a type either by a type inference or by a type checking or a mixture of the two. And only if all terms have valid types, the program is actually compiled into a runtime that you can then execute. Right, so um, compiled time type checking. Everything that happens on the type level happens during compile time. So that is important to keep in mind that we have a, a clear phase distinction in Haskell and we can rely on the fact that stuff that you're doing on the type level happens while you're compiling the program, stuff that you're doing on the value level happens while you're running the program. So type errors in particular, they happen all at compile time, and they, while they do not prevent, they at least usually reduce the number of runtime errors um, you will hopefully get. So you'll catch um, a large class, hopefully, of your, of your actual programming errors as type errors in, uh, in phase which is early on in program development. So if you have a, an informal description of a very small um, API where you can say, oh, I can, I can get uh, the, the root um, in order to obtain uh, a current value of some counter or I can post to step in order to increment the counter, um, then uh, uh, this is how it looks in service. And, um, and actually, almost everything you see here is defined by servant. I mean, there are, uh, uh, all the things you get, post, JSON, um, this funny operator, that funny operator, these are all things that are provided by the, by the servant library. So that, that's what I mean by domain, embedded domain-specific language, right? So there are lots of things that are given to you by Servant that allow you to put these descriptions together. All in all, it then forms something that lives on the Haskell type level. So this is a Haskell type synonym, um, and uh, this is an API description. But you can see that it roughly corresponds to the above. So um, the, the root here is implicit, right? And going down to step is denoted by um, uh, putting a type level string step here. Um, the, um, there is a nesting or chaining combinator that looks like this that you can uh, use to either do multiple levels of paths, which you don't have here, or to chain other combinators. And then every line, and the lines, if you like, are separated by this one, uh, ends in a verb. And uh, so the first one is a get, which says we are. Um, to return some kind of type integer in JSON format. And uh, the second one is a post, which is also supposed to return an integer in JSON format. So I'm going to make it so that step is going to also return the updated counter value. Okay, so the correspondence is clear? Okay, yeah. What does this apostrophe mean? Right, okay, so. Um, uh, type level Haskell peculiarities. So um, this is a, a type level Haskell list with one element in it. It's not the type of lists of JSON values, but it is actually a type level list with a single element in it. And because these two things syntactically clash, um, uh, you have to disambiguate using the, the quote. If, you, if I wouldn't write the quote, THC would as a type of list of JSON things, which doesn't, doesn't make sense. So what you can do here is you can provide a list of content types, and, uh, and we are only providing a single one. Um, and then if we, if we add, add another one, so we say we can also have a variant of step that actually increments the counter by uh, n, where n is actually taken from um, the, um, 
half of the request. Um, we can we can write it like this. Um, we would chain another one and say step, and then there is a capture, and we actually give the capture a name that can be reused, for example, for documentation. And we say we want to parse this thing as an int, and uh, and then it also goes to chain. Okay, so this is a type, but it's strange because it's a type that does not actually directly have code associated with it. It's not a type signature of a specific piece of code. It's a type that is purely there as a description that lives on the type level. And we're actually going to use it as a source of type level computation. So um, in Haskell these days, at least, I mean, when I say Haskell, I mean GHC, really. Um, not, not standard Haskell in any sense. Um, Servant is using um, almost every type system extension that exists. <laughs> uh, so um, uh, what you can do is you can write functions that operate on the type level. And I said there is a phase distinction. And if you write the function that operates on the type level, it takes a type as input and produces another type as output. And the computation that goes along with that is also executed at compile time. So this all happens during type checking as part of the delegation. And, um, and we are going to use this information that is contained in here that kind of describes the API to um, quite some extent uh, in order to compute other types. And these other types are the types that we actually will have values for. So I'm going to show you examples of that. So, um, If you look at the task of generating a server and a client um, independently, I mean, there are different scenarios here. You might want to implement a server and a client at the same time, both using servant. Um, and you would just specify the API and use um, a servant for generating both. Um, but you could also say uh, you're just implementing a server and expect clients to be external, but you could also use servant to interface to an existing web API. So there is a service somewhere and you just want to write a client, so you can give an API description for that. If we, um, if we look at it, um, in both cases, we essentially, this is slightly simplified, need a tuple that looks a bit like this. Um, if we have a server, we all need to handle incoming requests. And there are three kinds of requests, right? There is a chain of three different things. There can either be a get request to the root, there can be a post request to step, or there can be a post request to this one. So we, um, we need three different handlers for the three kinds of requests. And all three of them will ultimately return an int in this case. That's because that's what the API specifies. And the third one actually additionally gets an, in, uh, an input. And they're all allowed to have side effects. So that's why they are an IO. So, but, um, so essentially, it's simplified view on what the server is. It is a triple of three handlers. <laughs> the server for this API is a triple of three handlers that have these types. Okay. If you look at the client, um, well, what you need is uh, functions or code that can, inv that can invoke each of these three requests. So you would like to have a function for each possible kind of request. And um, uh, because the request is going to be sent via the network, it's certainly a side affecting request. Um, but if you want to issue a GET request, well, you can think of it as something of this type. It's um, an I.O. action that will ultimately, hopefully, give you an int back. Um, if you think of the step request, it also has this type. And if you think of the post, uh, of the step end request, it is, um, well, you have to supply an integer to it, and then it will construct, hopefully, the right request and give you the response back. Okay? So both for the server and the client, this type will be computed from that type. But then there is a diff there's a difference between these two. I mean, we could, we could now argue, why don't we actually start with this one? Why do we even specify that one? That's because all the 
extra information that's contained in here, but it's actually used to give you stuff for free. Right? <laughs> stuff that you don't actually need to do anymore. Um, so, um, uh, let's see. For the server, what you get for free is that incoming requests are automatically routed to the right handler. Right? And if you send illegal requests, like uh, wrong paths or wrong methods or uh, otherwise malformed, the, the right status codes will be sent back and error message will be sent back. Um, it will also already extract and parse request parameters and make sure that they correspond to the specified input types that are expected and handle errors if, if there's anything wrong with that. And after the handler, the subhandler has actually run, it will actually correspond the, the right HTTP response from the Haskell value and um, send it back. And the only thing you need to supply, morally speaking, is this triple of handlers. And that's the only real thing that you have to feed in. All the rest you get for free. And okay, and you need to actually tell it where to run the server on what port or whatnot. So, um, but, um, Essentially, the essential piece of information that you have to supply yourself is this. And the rest is kind of for free. And um, uh, if you look at the client, well, we, again, we need to supply info about where the server is running so that the requests can actually be sent to the right server. Um, but here we obtain this, this kind of triple. We obtain a function for each um, request that we can use. And what we get for free is that when we invoke these, um, the right request, depending on, on the code we use, will be uh, generated. The request will actually be sent to the server. The response will be obtained. And then the result value will be extracted from the response. And, given to you the right form. and if you are writing a client or you're writing a server, you can concentrate on the interesting parts. So we no longer have to worry about with whether the, the request parameters are actually there or whether they have the right type or you simply can assume that this has already been done for you. Um, another interesting application is generating documentation. Again, well, this basically gives you a whole lot of documentation, but not everything. So what you get for free is exactly what the API already specifies, what the valid requests are, what the types of the inputs and outputs are, what the status codes that can be sent are, or what you still need or at least probably want to supply is additional textual information actually explaining what each of these things do. Right? You might want to attach uh, actual text that says this is what this thing does. Again, you probably want to attach that in a type safe way so that you cannot um, attach documentation to something that doesn't actually exist. Um, so, um, again, conceptually speaking, this is simplified, actually looks a little bit different than practice, but what you can think of, if you wanted to document all the, um, the functions, you could compute from the original type, a type that looks like this, saying, oh, if I actually have three different um, requests in my API, I probably want to give three different uh, pieces of documentation or textual explanation for what each of them does. And perhaps in the third case, I also want to give an extra piece of information explaining what the parameter is for. Right. And um, so even though the actual computer types are different or more complicated, I hope this gives you a little bit of an idea of that this is the idea of having a type that is um, containing a lot of documentation that is written using um, this DSL that acts just as a description and as a source for computing other types from it, like this one, which are then actually useful for, um, for assigning values to, to them. Okay. So at this point, I would uh, like to um, switch to showing you something, um, which is again the, the, same, um, the same example, but with less lying. <laughs> um, so, um, so here is, um, can you read this or should I make it larger? Okay. Is it okay? Bigger? Better? Is that better? Okay. All right. 
So, um, actually, I don't need to put the get here. And it's more uniform with what we have on the slide. Um, so, so what I've done um, is just to demonstrate also that you have abstraction mechanisms available that Haskell gives you. Um, I've uh, actually layer the description of the API, so rather than inlining everything like we have on the slides, I'm saying here that the counter API is actually the get API and the step API and the step n API, and then I'm giving each of these three as a separate type system. And um, uh, they should look more or less like they do on the slide. Okay, and, um, and then the first thing that I actually want to do is to um, use them as a server. And if I um, <coughs> this is probably too small, so it's harder. To <coughs> uh, anyway, I'm um, going to say this. So if I, uh, if I look at the type of serve, so there's one function called serve, and, um, and what serve does is the bulk of the work of constructing the server for us. Um, what we need to feed the, the serve function is a proxy for the layout. So a proxy is a value level witness of a type, and since our API description is just a type, we can explicitly say for which API we want to generate the server by passing in the, a proxy for that, for that API type. And then we need to pass in a config parameter, which I will not go into detail of, so that will always be empty in, in our uh, setting. And then I need to pass in something which is called server of layout, and that is exactly this triple of subhandlers that I've been talking about. And then we can get an application out, and that application is in terms of another Haskell library that we can then just run, um, and then that will run the server. So, um, so essentially, um, this server argument is the most important thing, and we need this proxy. Um, the uh, proxy I'm defining right here, um, so there is a, a counter API um, proxy, which just, um, I mean, has no specific value, it just links it. And then the handlers are in a different module. Um, uh, no, this is smaller again. So, um, There are two differences in practice between what I showed on the slides and what uh, happens in the reality. The first is that uh, the triple is still a triple of subhandlers, but it's not using the Haskell triple type, which is written using parents and commas, but is using a servant specific tuppling type, which uses the same uh, operator symbol for chaining things together that you also use in the API description. So um, you're, you're, you're putting the handlers for the individual things together using the symbol, but it builds something which is essentially just a triple of handlers. And uh, the other thing that is different is that the handlers are not actually living in I.O. They can do, uh, in, additional, uh, in, in addition to I.O., they can, they can throw errors. So they are using um, an except T servant R.R. I.O. But I think that should actually be an abstract type, so hopefully in a, in a future version. Um, I'm not proposing to actually call it server M, but it will probably be called something which is, uh, is just abstract, so that you don't always see this, this language. <coughs> and then in order to actually um, like maintain the state uh, for the server, I'm using a, a transactional variable that holds the counter value, and I'm passing that everywhere. I'm doing this completely independent of server, and server has some functionality to also do this sort of more internally, but in this uh, small example, that would be overkill. So my, my handler function is just additionally taking a, 
transactional variable <coughs> containing the counter and not passing them to each other sometimes. Or to each other. And then the, the handler for get is really just reading the T bar, giving us the current value. And the handler for step n um, is uh, reading the T bar, adding uh, a value to it, and writing the T bar and returning the new value. Um, in fact, I mean, I could implement all three using handle step n, <laughs> replacing handle get by handle step n zero. But, um, but in principle, yeah, I mean, uh, the, the point here is just to show that you can, you can use Haskell functions as normal Haskell functions. And there's relatively little in these individual handlers that actually hints at the fact that you're working in a web context. Um, there is something in the sense that you can fail and you can so sort of say if, uh, if you in the handler decide that you want to fail, you can set a particular status code, or if you um, if you specify um, using the API description language that your response needs certain header values set, then you can set them in there. So it's not completely agnostic of the web setting, but it's mostly just the normal Haskell functions that you write down. Okay, um, then we can try to. Uh, to run this thing. Um, I would just compile it, but my laptop is so slow. Uh, so I'm just if it's running, I can hopefully just send something like. Uh, oh, I didn't actually show the name for. Before I run it, I should actually show that. Uh, there is not much more that needs to be done. So we're handle counter API I've just shown. Uh, we're invoking serve with the proxy, an empty config, and the <coughs> handle counter API as the handler, and then we are running it on port 8080 on localhost. And I'm initializing the transactional variable with zero. So the initial counter value will be zero. So if I do a curl on localhost, So I, I tricked myself with, I said I wouldn't rebuild, but then I removed the get part from the code. So then root is no longer a valid request, so I have to rebuild after all. Uh, reuse the same API module, so I'm importing API which is exactly the same API as I did before, and I'm um, uh, yep. uh, looking <coughs> there is a function called client which is much like um, the function serve. So the function flyn takes a proxy for the layout. It takes a base URL that contains information for where the server is actually running. It takes a manager which is kind of maintaining the connections. Um, and, uh, and then it gives us a client. And the client is again a type level function which will actually give us this triple of three different actions that we can execute. Um, so we need to provide the base URL the proxy is, is clear, that's the same proxy. The base URL 
we're just going to say again that it's localhost and API key. And um, uh, the manager, we just can create one using a standard library. M, and then I can um, ask what is the type of the client of a counter API and the space URL that I have on and M. And now I see that GHC will actually expand the type level computation and will tell me that the type of this thing is a triple again of again some except T transformed IO things, but otherwise they have exactly the types that I've shown on the slide. So the first component will be an IO giving us a counter, the second thing will be an IO giving us a counter, and the third thing will expect a counter as an input and give us um, an IO of a counter back. So um, I can do um, less. A match on the three components and say I want to call the first get and the second step one and the third step n. And then I've written this little convenience function here around client m that will actually handle this servant except TIO, servant error in IO so that I can transform one of these except transform things into a simple IO function that will simply throw the error if it occurs rather than catch it. And then I can hopefully, if the server is still running, um, oh, I need to actually call a run client. Um, uh, get um, using a Haskell function and see that the value is still 6 because nobody apparently has access to it in the meantime. And, uh, <laughs> and then I can um, step 1 take the old API, which is counter API, and extend it with a new API, which is called Swagger API. And Swagger API is defined right here. And I'm going to say that under um, Swagger.json, I'm going to serve something of type Swagger as JSON using a GET request. So my server will serve its own Swagger specification. And then I'm also actually going to serve the Swagger UI application um, using something which is called raw, which is another combination I've provided, which is kind of an escape route that allows us to, um, to get out of servant and say, we are going to plug some different thing underneath and we're not going to do anything with it. Um, and then the full API has a proxy again. And then the handler for the Swagger API, so the handler of the full thing, so we're running serve full API empty config, we're using the old handle counter API with an initialized counter, and we're joining it up with handle swagger API, and handle swagger API will um, return swagger, which is defined below as the handler for the swagger JSON file, and it will serve a directory for my, for my hard drive, uh, so this is just locally um, for the swagger UI app. Um, and then, yeah. And then Swagger is um, essentially just this, really. The first line is the important one. The two Swagger of counter API it gives me uh, a Swagger um, <coughs> value that contains all the documentation and Swagger format that is extractable from my API. And then I can attach additional information to it, textual information where I want. And uh, there are some global things, like the first three lines, where I'm just saying, oh, this is the title of the entire thing, and this is the description of the entire thing. 
but there are also some API specific things where I'm saying I want to give a summary for a particular endpoint. And this is a type safe attachment. So the sub API function, which is implemented in terms of the sub operations function, is actually taking a proxy for a specific piece of the API and uh, statically going to check whether that piece of the API is actually contained in the large API and identifying the right position at the same time. So this is also going to be checked that these things actually exist and um, I, can, I can add these things. These funny operators, they are all supplied by the lens library. Uh, so if you're not familiar with that, so there's another bunch of things, but it's mostly independent of what Servant is doing. And if you don't like the operators, there are uh, named functions for most of these things that you can use instead as well. Okay, um, then just to show that briefly, I can uh, kill the old server and use the Swagger server. Um, Swagger containing server instead, which traditionally serves the Swagger specification. And then hopefully I can go to this URL, which invokes the Swagger UI with more or less the JSON file location. And then I'll get um, the Swagger specification that I can look at and explore and actually um, try it out. Now I'm going to get zero again because I started a new server, but if I'm going to go to step and say try it out here, I'm going to get one, and if I try it out again, I'm going to get two. Or if I go to step n, I'm going to pass the value I'm going to say try it out, then that goes up to seven and so on. So this is uh, nice and you can add extra stuff in there. And, and this is um, a completely independent contribution, right? So, um, so in a way this, uh, this also shows that the servant is actually meeting its extensibility goals <laughs> and that other people can actually go and, um, and write full new applications. Okay, so um, to conclude, uh, so um, we have this EBSL approach, which gives us abstraction and modularity and extensibility. The fact that we have types, the separation gives us that we can possibly have different implementations of the same API, that we can talk about things like having a server and a client and saying they're actually implementing the same API or compatible with the terms of the API. It also gives us that we can generate a lot of functionality for free by just extracting it from the type level that we can concentrate on writing the interesting code and that everything is relatively set. Um, in general, the more bigger, the bigger picture is actually really that I always want to say it, we should get away from the still very prevailing idea that types are the enemy, right? I mean, that we have to fight the compiler <laughs> to get our program accepted, and that we should instead see types as helpful guides that actually direct us gently into the right direction. And, um, and really, uh, by limiting what we can do, the types give us uh, hints as to um, where we should concentrate, what we should do, how we should actually write our program. Polymorphism and Haskell helps us to focus on the right inputs because we cannot even look at the structure of things that are polymorphic. If we know the types of inputs and outputs, we know what shapes they can have so that we can pattern match. And more and more we get from dependently typed programming languages this kind of interactive program development that we can actually write a function and then split into all the patterns. And I think Servant is nice in that it brings this kind of uh, helpful idea where the types really do a lot of the work for you over to, to web, to web programming. So there is more stuff in the servant description language that we have not seen things about. We have seen, but you can also do request response headers, request bodies, query parameters. And um, uh, uh, yeah, there is other ongoing work and so on. But this is uh, the end of my talk. Uh, thank you for listening. Um, if you have any questions.
I guess um, the more current state there probably uh, Julian or Julian or Sonja can. Uh, there has been some. I mean, the the, the first part of it. Uh, yeah, you can just do it. I mean. Uh, in a similar way as I have shown here that you can handle some states using transactional variables, you can also do other things like session states and, and there is this um, config parameter which can actually be used partially for things like that, uh, for initializing certain things and then, then caching something like a session token or stuff like that. Um, the, um, uh, but there is ongoing work in this area and perhaps you so that there is no session combinator that provides this like easy to for you. Um, I think it's certainly possible and it just needs someone to write that. And th there is people that have written session combinators in their project. Um, yeah, like for example. Uh, yeah. But they haven't been provided up to because they're, they're too specific, I guess. Yes, but I mean we're yeah, but we are using <coughs> we're using Servant and two projects as well, so I, I think and um, at least one of them is using a handwritten I guess if you have a lot of requirements, it would certainly be nice that you have something that works out of the box. But it's not uh, it's not a block or right now. If you, if you need something simple, you can probably just set it up yourself. Could we expand on the semantics of uh, type signature for, um, I think, just a step further? So I think when you we were getting the end, Yes, in a way you can look at it. Like that, I mean, you, you can look at it as if you are taking the type signature and turning it into JSON. Yes, this is essentially what the core functionality of Servant Square is doing: is taking this type signature and transforming it into a Haskell data type, which is called Swagger, which you can then serialize to JSON. Yeah. So then you can attach additional additional pieces of information. My question is: Could you reverse it? I'm in a position where I have the JSON schema yes. of the whole API. Could I use pointing somehow and get it automatically to write this type? In principle, yes. Um, uh, but uh, perhaps not in a way that uh, is without any kind of tweaking on your side. I and mean, there is still some work that you would need to do. I mean, but in principle, yeah, the reverse side works. I mean, you can use techniques which are similar to what Sonker was talking about, generic programming. Um, that, um, that not just do this, I mean, this is also some form of generic programming, but not just take the type um, the schema in the first place and generate some JSON out of it, but you can also, in a way, sort of discover a type from, uh, from a value. But it will always be a two-phase process if you want to do it in the Haskell world. Either you need template Haskell or something which is sort of um, a two-phase process. If you want to do it completely seamlessly, I think you need a dependently type language because there you can actually take things like strings and compute types from them without um, needing uh, a separate step. But, but here is where the, the phase distinction that Haskell has still hits you if you
you, if you're starting with a runtime value, which is a string that you're normally getting at runtime, um, or, or something like that, then you cannot really uh, uh, do something. If you actually have the string known before, you can sort of do it all in one process. I'm not quite sure what your situation was, but if you have one static JSON specification already, you want something that works. It changes, right? So if you leave it dynamically, then, uh, then I guess you're, uh, you're, you're kind of slightly better off with the dependency. Maybe one last quick remark, then. Yeah. Just a comment. Uh, with all the caveats that Andres made, um, it's not very nice one now. There is a, so Swagger Cogen, the main Swagger, um, Library does has it recently it has been merged to generate the types um, from Swagger uh, generates certain types. So the opposite direction does work. You have a Swagger description of your API in JSON. Um, it does generate the Haskell code that corresponds to that description. It as and there are lots of caveats. But, uh, 